Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that you have an answer for each one of us. You're such a God of love. And we can look to you to bring us through every trial. We just come to you in the name of Jesus, Lord. We thank you that he is here to walk with us. In your name, dear Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right. Well, you know, I want to start by reading a verse in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. And later on, he, he's speaking to Israel in verse 23 and 24. He says, how canst thou say I am not polluted? I have not gone after Baalim. See thy way in the valley. Know what thou hast done. Thou art a swift dromedary traversing her ways, a wild ass. Used to the wilderness that snuffeth up the wind at her pleasure. In her occasion, who can turn her away? All they that seek her will not weary themselves, because in her month they shall find her. And he's calling Israel a wild ass in the wilderness, that she will come to you when she's in heat. And um, I was born into an Adventist home, but my father and mother uh, were baptized when they first got married. And my father was like half converted. So I learned a sort of a hypocrisy that you could be in the church and you could live a certain way and you could still be considered saved. You were a Christian. So my father was kind of wild. He was a very intelligent man uh, being, you know, Northern European and a very brilliant man. He did not graduate from eighth grade because he had to help on their dairy. So um, somebody came to the Valley with their, their well rig. My father drilled the wells in the Round Valley Indian Reservation of Covalo. And my father shot over his head with a gun to scare him away because he was supporting his family. And um, it was decided through the church because there was no police in the valley that we would have to move. And we moved because of the circumstances. He could never get settled anywhere again, every half a year, every year. And my mother tried to hold it together for all of our family. She um, did the best she could. She was always packing or unpacking or getting us clothes for school or trying to give us something to eat. And she had no time for training uh, her girls. And I was the middle child. So um, we moved and moved and moved. And when I finally got married and had a child of my own, I was too young. And uh, but it was good because mother and father were going through a divorce then. And um, they really wanted the kids out of the house so they could they wanted to stay with it till the kids were grown, but then go their own ways because it just didn't work out very well. And um, I ended up going in and out of relationships. And they didn't work out very well for me because I hadn't had the training of a mother. So I was kind of like this wild ass. I like to be free. I like to, um, every year about the same time, I would get the urge to move no matter where I was. And um, God was with me. Every, as I look back at it, everything that I went through and everything that happened, he brought me through and kept me from anything happening. I know it was my mother's prayers. So, um I'm going to bring you forward to, I got out of a particularly bad relationship in 1995 and moved to Humboldt County in the Redwoods of Northern California. And um, I went away for a year, but, oh, now here's somebody coming to my front door and he's going to ring the doorbell. Hold on a second. I'll be right back. I got a meeting with Norway. Can I okay, thank you. I'm a speaker, so I can get so thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay. He he uh, brought me cat food for my feral cats that I feed. Okay. So in 1995, and uh, I went away for a year and ended up coming back. I have a sister here and Laurel, and I thought, well, at least I'll be near family. We can encourage one another. And um, I went looking for a place to get my furniture out of storage. And one showed up on the internet that was a little cabin up the hill. So I got in my car and I was driving up the hill to go and see this little cabin. 
And it was a long, windy road. And I got to the top of the hill and I could look down and see it. Oh, but it was so tiny. And in the seat of my car right next to me, as though my guardian angel spoke to me, as though he was sitting in the car with me, he said with urgency in his voice, I could still hear it in my head, don't go there. And I argued with him. I don't, <laughs> like I said, I was like this wild ass in the desert, uh, free to come and go and do as I liked. And my guardian angel said, don't go there. And I told him, here I am talking to the blank space in my car. <laughs> I've never heard his voice again, by the way. Um, I said, I can see that it's too little for me and my furniture wouldn't fit there, but I've driven all the way up here and I just want to look at it. <laughs> so. Um, I went down to look at it. It had a huge deck and it overlooked a vineyard and the mountains. And it was beautiful. And the rent was, this was back in whenever it was, 1998. The rent was like $500 a month. Very reasonable. And um, it was very tiny, you know. But this area around it was so beautiful. And so <clears throat> I ended up taking it. And... Um, <clears throat> I worked as a medical transcriptionist at the hospital and I did some transcription for one of the other hospitals at home on my computer. And as the days came and went, some odd things began happening. I came home one day and there was a pinto bean on my dresser. And I looked at it and I thought, that's odd, but I threw it away. And then the next week, there it was again, a pinto bean on my dresser. And then the next week I came home and there was somebody's had sat on the edge of my bed. You could see the print of where they had sat. It was very obvious. And um, the next week I came home, there was a needle, a sewing needle stuck through the lampshade of one of my lamps. And that was felt kind of scary because it felt like somebody was coming into my home. So I went around and I checked the windows and you could lock them, but you could still open them. And I checked the doors, and there was a window in the bedroom that I couldn't close enough to lock it. So I ended up having to take the window off the frame and fix it. They had slid the glass over some in such a way that I couldn't lock it. And that's how they had gotten into the, one of the ways they had gotten into the house. And um, that was kind of scary to me. And as time went on, um, my my neighbor lady had they gave me some work helping them paint their house of the landlord and his wife and while i was going in the house for something i saw that there was a open doorway behind there was an opening behind their fireplace that you could go down somewhere in a lower level but there was like a blanket hanging over it and i saw it and i know they knew i saw it and and i don't i think they were doing drugs in there or something and one day we were walking around the property and they showed me a grave that was there on the property. And it was kind of scary. It felt like kind of like a, a warning to me in some way, you know, as though I had seen something I shouldn't have seen. And her husband was always coming over to help with this or help with that. They gave me free, hooked me up to their uh, satellite dish. And I found out later on that they could see what was going on in my house and hear because they cooked it up to my computer. And when I was on my computer, I saw some kind of an app there that connected it to something. And um, it just was quite crazy. And they, I found out later on that they came from San Diego. They had been involved in a car thief gang. And uh, they had, uh, they talked to dead people. That's what she said. Um, and they had voodoo things around the house. And she uh, told me that she was in bed one morning and these people in khaki clothing were standing by her bed, but they were dead people and that they were talking to each other. And they said, these people are good to have here. They're going to take care of the land. And then they disappeared. And so she had some kind of delusions or maybe she really saw something. I, I don't want to, I don't know. Um, I can't make assumptions on that. But um, one day I was making some, fr cooking a tortilla on a frying pan and it really smoked badly. I don't know why it smoked so badly, but I didn't quite burn it. So I ate it anyway and I got sick. 
And uh, it was a different kind of sick than I've ever had before. It was in my head. And um, after the next two days, I was able to go back to work again. And um, my landlord asked me, he goes, you know, he had one or one other rental on the property there. <laughs> and there were some people there who were trimming pot. They they grew pot somewhere and they were trimming pot. And they he was really sick. And my landlord, his name was Alan, he said, do you think you could help this guy get well? Because um, he's you have herbal things that you believe in. You know, maybe you could help him feel better. And so I uh, I tried everything I had and nothing worked. And I was working in, in transcription, as I said, and we had a book on drugs and uh, poisons. And so I could look it up to see what you're supposed to do for those kinds of things. Well, um, it wasn't very long before a jar of apricots that I had canned. I ate some of them and put the jar in the refrigerator. But then I didn't eat any more of it. And after a week or two, a silvery patch showed up in there. and that was kind of weird. And so I threw it away and uh, I made some tea chino, which is an herbal coffee. And then I forgot to clean it and it had this lime green mold growing on it. And I'm like, okay, something's wrong here, but it's not easy to find a house to rent here. I mean, it's very hard because most of the people were growing pot in their spare bedrooms, trying to earn a living, you know? And so their, the rentals were all used as indoor grows and you couldn't find a place to live which is why I was so excited about this little place. And um, so I'm like, I don't, I don't know where I would go. What would I do? And I don't have anyone to help me pack my furniture. And it happened again. I got sick again, only this time it was worse. And I, I couldn't believe that somebody would uh, pers- put poison me. So I, I had figured out ways to lock all my doors and windows so nobody could get in. I put dowels in the window so you couldn't open it. And I put a um, a lock on my back door. And uh, at the same time, one night, the landlord just walked, walked in the house and I had everything locked up and he was talking to me. And I was like, how'd you get in here? And oh, uh, he, he left and he just said, well, I just came to talk to you about such and such. And then he left. And I thought, no, that is just really odd, really creepy. And um, one day his wife referred to him as the... Uh, witch of the wicked witch of the west or something like that and i thought oh maybe they're into witchcraft i'm just not sure and so um i got really sick one night i i could hear okay it was mid i heard it in my head i could hear this ding and, and i looked at the clock and it was midnight and i felt myself getting sick and i thought i'm gonna die uh because i i said this this is it i'm gonna die i don't think i'm gonna make it tonight and at times like that, you don't know what to do. I, I prayed and I asked the Lord, Lord, what do I do? And if I felt impressed to call the emergency room at the hospital where I was a transcriptionist. And the nurse that answered the phone, was his name was Carl. And um, I said, Carl, I think I've been poisoned. Would you do anything other than charcoal if I came in? And he said, no, I wouldn't. But instead, he's like, why do you think you've been poisoned? Who would poison you? And um, I said, I just want to know, would you do anything besides charcoal? Is there anything else that you would do if I came in? And he said, no, no, that would be it. So charcoal didn't do any good. And when I looked up in the poison book, um, well, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, so I said, I'm not going to go in then. And But I was getting sicker and sicker. And it was in my head and it was terrible. And so, um, and my whole body, I drove over to my sister's place. She was about 15 miles from me. And when I got there, I was trembling and I I couldn't go in the house because it was too warm. I had to be out in the wind and the cold. And I laid on her floor for probably 24 hours, just barely breathing and moving. And uh, when I got up enough strength to get up again to look, that somebody had put some white powder on the dash of my car. I don't know what it was. And I guess I should have taken it to the police, but I was feeling so sick and I washed it off and um, wondered what in the world were they, they thought that I would die and that that would be the reason why, you know, that would show that that's what killed me. So I talked to the emergency room doctor where I worked, his name was Dr. Steinbach and uh, asked him about my symptoms. And he said, that sounds like organophosphates or Roundup. 
you know, or glyphosate. And uh, he said, it will go through your body so fast that uh, we can't test. We have to test for it within eight hours or we can't catch it. And he goes, it'll do a lot of damage like wildfire. And so I spent, I just felt so sick that I just hard, could hardly function, but I kept having to work. I didn't have a choice. And somebody helped me move my furniture out of there. And I had to go back over there and clean the place to get my deposit back. Um, but I was terrified of that. But I went and I cleaned it and I got my deposit back. But she told me that I was going to die to my face. A landlady did. She said, you're going to die. You're going to die. And I go, um, ask her why. I said, I'm sorry. What did I do? And she goes, you're, you're going to die. And so um, later on, whether it was because they thought I had seen some things I shouldn't have seen, or I knew some things I shouldn't know. Um, she confessed that she thought her husband, she left a message on my phone that her she thought her husband was having an affair with me. But the truth was she was the one who was having an affair with a contractor up the hill. And so oftentimes when people are guilty of something, they, uh, they think they see it everywhere else. I don't know. Anyway, so um, I began to have to struggle to get well, but I was still alive and they realized I was still alive. They hadn't finished the job. So I think they thought that they needed to finish the job and they were going to have to go after me. And I ended up uh, living with my sister and we moved all my furniture into her, her mobile home where she was living. And it was kind of tight, but she had two daughters and we were close. But in the night, as I was sleeping and Everybody else was in their own beds and it was quiet. Evil spirits were harassing me in my mind. And things of mine had disappeared. A couple of pillow slips had disappeared. And I know in voodoo, I understood later that they'll take something of yours and somehow that gives them permission to hurt you. I don't think I understand it really, but my pillow slips disappeared and a couple of other things disappeared. And um, I never did find them. They're still gone to this day. Uh, Going to work got to be so hard, and no matter where I put my car, they would do something to it to damage it. And one day, um, I just said, "Okay, that's it. It's done. I'm going to go live. I've got to go see my mother and live with my mother near Yosemite." And I went there for a while, and I got another job, but I wasn't getting well, and I wasn't. I didn't understand because in my life, I'd been so healthy. Um, if you get food poisoning, you do a few things and you're fine, you're back up and you're going again. But that wasn't happening. I was just getting worse and worse and having panic attacks. And um, at my mother's place where I was working, my brain wasn't working right. I couldn't remember people's names that I knew. And I couldn't really tell her what had happened to me because she was not so well herself. And I ended up moving back. Uh, my sister said, what should I do with your furniture? And I thought, I have to go back over there to take care of my responsibilities. And I was terrified to come back to Humboldt County. So I came back over and I ended up marrying somebody because he lived on in the mountain, down in a canyon, way away where it was safe and where nobody could find me. And I needed to feel safe to where I could get well. And so I moved in with him and uh, it lasted five years. And the, in the meantime, I got a job as a housekeeper because then nobody could would know where I was. They couldn't follow me. And um, I ended up with cancer and five organs and my brain and my throat, my liver, my stomach, and my lungs. Yeah, that was right. And um, Dr. Clark was the one that I first started using her program. And she helped me a lot, or her program helped me a lot, but it wasn't good enough. And I didn't understand about parasites, like Dan has been teaching me about that. And um, what I did was I found Joyce. She was teaching radionics, and she gave me radionically ionized tinctures, and which got me over the cancer in, in six months. But just because the cancer's gone doesn't mean you're well. You know, you, you have to be very sick before you get cancer. And just because you get rid of the cancer, you still have some work to do. You still have a lot of whatever the cause was of the cancer in the first place. You got some cleaning up to do. And uh, I began learning about liver cleanses. I began, um, then I met the Dr. Reams and Challen Wakoff, and he helped me with the RBTI program. And he got me to where I felt good for the first time. 
he, he got me to where I, I could actually function well and could think and could do things. But I put on a whole bunch of weight and uh, I got discouraged. And so I quit the program. And um, Alan and Sandy uh, saw me somewhere one day and they were really freaked out. And they were so frightened because they had not killed me that they sold their vineyard and they moved down to Lake County. So they don't even live here anymore. And um, that whole program, you know, I, I went to the Lord when the evil spirits would harass me at night. And I said, Lord, whatever it takes for me to get well, whatever it is, Lord, please do it I, for me to be saved. I don't care what happens. Just I want to be saved. I don't want to be lost. And I gave him permission to do whatever he wanted. And I have never taken that back, even though things have been very, very hard at times. And um, they actually did a whole lot more things that I feel like that he wanted to kill me. He wanted to talk to me by the park. And I was a fool. I went with him down a trail to sit on a, on a tree. And all of a sudden, I felt my, my angel impressing me how to behave, just to be cheerful and friendly and don't look afraid. Because I think he was going to kill me and throw me in the river. I mean, I just had this really strong feeling. But the Lord delivered me out of that. And I learned a lesson. Don't trust and don't, you know, follow people wherever they, what they want to do. But the Lord delivered me from the harassment of the evil spirits. It got quiet. Now, I had a cousin who used to say, how do I know that God is with me? I don't have any way of knowing that. I ask for help. I do things. But I don't sense his presence. And what I learned was that when it's quiet around you, and when you feel like you can have the freedom to make any decision you want to do, you can know that that's God buffering you. That's him. He's there. He's there near you to give you that peace. Because if he was not there, you would not have peace. I promise you, the evil spirits would not leave you alone for a moment. Satan's dis desire is to destroy and not to save. And God's plan is to bring us through everything. Um, you know, the fact that he forgave me for all of the foolishness in my life and my hypocrisy and my, um, you know, I would was more like the world than I was like a real Adventist, even though my mother was a good Adventist. But the Lord changed all of that. I realized that what's more important than um, having things is good health and a good walk with the Lord. and. He's there for you. He can bring you through anything that happens to you. He has the strength for it. You know, in the I have the 1884 Great Controversy. And there's something here that happens in Jacob's time of trouble. We're going to have to go through some time of trouble. And we need to be prepared for that. It says here, could men see with heavenly vision? They would behold companies of angels that excel in strength stationed about those who have kept the word of Christ's patience. With sympathizing tenderness, angels have witnessed their distress. They have heard their prayers. They're waiting the word of their commander to snatch them from their peril. But they must wait yet a little longer. The people of God must drink of the cup and be baptized with the baptism. The very delay so painful to them as the best answer to their petitions. As they endeavor to wait trustingly for the Lord to work, they are led to exercise faith, hope, and patience, which have been too little exercised during their religious experience. It says here that for the elect's sake, the time of trouble will be shortened and the end will come more quickly than men expect. So what is that? We have to exercise faith, hope, and patience. Sometime during my efforts to get well, I had a Rife machine. I've had three of them. Um, but I made some big mistakes when using it. So I would recommend that if you get a Rife machine to be careful how you use it. Because uh, if you have, as an example, <laughs> if you have tapeworms and you're using your Rife machine, if you don't know the exact frequency, every segment has a different frequency. And you take out a segment in the middle, you're going to have two. Um, if you <laughs> if you take out three segments, you're going to have 
six. I don't know. So you just have to know what you're doing. And it starts at a lower frequency and every segment goes up a little higher, higher, higher. And so um, this one was made in Switzerland. I forget the name of it now, but this one would scan you and then it would show you everything that you had wrong. And then it would feed you back the exactly the frequencies that you needed to heal your problems. It was a very powerful one. But one night I was like, ah, I'm, it's, I can't stand this. I'm killing every one of them. <laughs> And I think I made my parasite problem really bad. And um, I would do crazy things. That was at the wild ass in the desert. I um, took niacin because that expands your vessels, blood vessels. And then I used my, my rife machine because then with all that electricity going through the blood, it would really be expanded and would really give me a high dose. So, that, <laughs> so um you have to be careful what you do, but God has always brought, whenever I asked him for help, he would bring to me what I needed to know. He would bring to me a person I needed to talk to. And um, the last time I saw Alan and Sandra, I had taken a job at our local market. This is a very small area. We have uh, a town with 350 people in it, one with like a hundred, a thousand. It's very tiny areas. And so I got a job as a checker for a while. They came through my line and they were, she just looked like she was going to pass out from fright. And I knew that the Lord was protecting me and I didn't have any fear anymore. The fear is gone. She's given me the victory in my life. And now I understand so much more about God's desire for each one of us that he will bring you through. And one day I was talking to him. I go, you know, Lord, I just feel like I have on a dirty diaper because of my life. You know, the way that my life has been um, in and out of relationships. And this last one didn't last either. It was five years. And um, he, he was a guitar maker and he lived um, way out in the woods and he had a terrible temper. So so we're divorced and I don't I'm not going to get married again. I don't believe the Lord has that on on the future for me. It's almost over anyway. But he will bring us through no matter what he t and he told me, he goes, when you take your baby and you change your baby's diaper. What do you do with the old diaper? It's gone. It's out of here. It's not coming back. He goes, I have buried your sins in the depths of the sea. They're as far as the east is from the west. You are not going to gather them back. They're gone. And you just have to trust in, trust in me and believe that it's his righteousness, his robe that he's going to clothe you with. We can just be so grateful for that. And one day we're going to see him very soon face to face. And I, I want to encourage you. If you have anything in your life that's standing between you and the Lord too, don't be afraid to look at it. He's not afraid to look at it. He loves you in spite of what it is. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter how bad it is. He loves you and he's going to get rid of that dirty diaper and you're never going to see it again. Amen. Praise the Lord. Wow. Yeah. So uh, you had in the wild ass in the desert. <laughs> So share with us, please, when you got sick, when you got these five types of cancer, I mean, you were already living in a healthy way, probably following yeah, you yeah. Know, mostly the eight natural remedies. So, yeah, yeah. So what, what did you, did you do anything else with your diet afterwards? Or did you, what did you call that stuff you started to take? Oh, um. I tried almost everything. I think I, I hemorrhaged money trying things. I tried so many different things. I went on the, uh, the, the chicken only diet where all you eat is baked chicken and cooked carrots. And, um, that was helpful for a while. And, um, I tried Dr. Clark's liver cleanses and, um, John Thomas's program with, the uh, uh, colonics and, um, Dr. Clark's other things. And, then uh, when I met Thomas, he put me on a diet and every week I would call him and I would give him my numbers. I bought a lab kit and I had Dr. Reem's equation and I would give him all my numbers and then he would give me a diet for the next week or two. And then I would take everything for that week or two and then I would call him back and then we would do it again. And um, the radionic, are you talking about the radionically ionized tinctures? Yeah, I think that was okay. Yeah, you know, uh, radionics is based on, uh, I think, scalar waves. 
And if you understand quantum physics at all, um, with scalar waves, um, one of the basic things that they teach is that the only distance between any two points in the universe is simply an electrical address. So, which is why I can be on the phone with you and the distance between us is Norway to here, but we're face to face on my phone, you know, in the distance between or a fax machine, you can, I don't understand faxes. You put it in the machine and it comes out somewhere across the world, you know, but the, you know, the distance between any two points in the universe is simply an electrical address. So they get an electrical address on you and they can um give you they can actually give you frequency treatments with scalar waves uh from their home in your home and um so i wasn't certain what i thought about that i feel like that i really joyce and tom helt are the ones who helped me and they're adventists and they were not certain about whether this was a thing of the lord or not so they went into prayer and studied and they felt very convicted that what they are doing is different than what many radionics practices are doing and and they feel like they're okay. And I didn't go to them very often, but when I did, I always felt like the Lord told me to do it. I know that there's things that he has created in his universe that we don't understand. It's beyond our com our comprehension, you know, that the more that we go into microscopes, they're deeper and deeper, the more perfect things are and the more amazing they are and there's things that we don't really get. Like you can think positive thoughts, scalar waves are like if you're thinking positive thoughts for somebody and they feel better and or you're thinking bad thoughts towards somebody and they're not feeling better. I mean, there's just so much to it that I don't really understand. Um, Tom and Joyce are helping a friend of mine right now to get well. That's my little Norwegian blind friend, uh, Bridget, that I mention occasionally. She was blind. Um, when she was a child, her father sexually abused her. And uh, I believe that he gave her herpes in her eye. That somehow she got herpes and it traveled to her eye. One of her eyes has been removed and the other one has lost most of its sight. But Joyce was working with her with her tinctures. And the tinctures are herbal, different herbs, roots and seeds and leaves and flowers that she makes. And um, as she's taking them, she's getting her sight back in her eye. And, you know, yeah, and the virus that she had that was spreading from her brain to her heart is now gone, according to their diagnosis. So that's what I was using. I was using radionics. And um, but that was before later on, uh, when I met Eric Wilson, I began to question whether I should be doing that again, because you know how it is. We're we're scared of what we don't understand. When they said the world was not flat but round, there I think there were some people that got killed. You know, I mean, there's things that we don't understand, and when we learn it, we're scared for a while. Um, so yeah, it helped me a lot. The radionic tinctures. If you, if anybody's interested in that and wants to follow up with Tom and Joyce, I will be happy to share their um, phone number and address somewhere. Yeah, yeah please do. So um, yeah, send it to me, and then I can send it to people who ask for it. Okay, yes. And what they do is they would they have a piece of paper and they want you to, there's a square on it. You want to lick it, just press it with your tongue. And then you fill out the questions and then you fax it to them with a laser fax. And on there in the laser fax will transmit the frequencies of the electricity that's in your saliva. And on their end, they read it. And then they mail you the herbal tinctures that are required based on your diagnosis. And uh, those tinctures are like $36 a bottle. And uh, in my case, when I first did it, I had to have eight bottles. And the test is $90. So um, that's what happens there. But when I went to Dr. Reem's program, it felt like I had more control. It was something I could do in my own house. And I didn't have to pay that amount of money every month, every month for the tinctures. <clears throat> it gets expensive. So in my home, I just try to balance my diet. I eat more alkaline foods. I include the calciums. And that feels like something that's more affordable to me and I have more control over. Nice. I can test myself. I can see what's going on and I can take care of it. And it's not so expensive as the other is. Plus, when you're using those tinctures, you get sick. You don't feel good sometimes. Sometimes it's okay. But many times it's really bad. So um, yeah, you have to be pretty brave. My little friend Bridget's very brave. 
Mm-hmm. So that's a cleansing, probably. Probably. Yeah, you're probably right. So what about your thyroid? You had thyroid problems. Uh, maybe you should share, uh, you know, I thought it was incredible how you went from 11 in TSH and down oh, to yes, zero. Yes. Never heard about that. <laughs> yeah, well, um, first of all, I, I, well, Dr. Clark says that, okay, for if you have bad thyroid trouble, that you should include some shredded carrots with a little coconut and a little pinch of Himalayan salt in it to eat as a little salad. You should take your B1, your selenium, and your iodine. 10 drops three times a day. So I was doing that. And then I realized that I should take some glandulars because Dr. Reem says it's a very powerful way to get yourself some help. So I I got some uh, grass-fed beef thyroid, bovine thyroid from New Zealand. And it's 40 milligrams. So I can adjust my doses better. You know, I went to the hospital for my thyroid. They tested it and they put me on thyroid medicine. And I, I don't usually take any prescription drugs at all, but I I, uh, I went ahead and thought, okay, I'll try it. I want to see what it feels like to feel good. And so I took it, and the next day I felt fabulous. And then the day after that, I felt terrible. And so I knew that it was because they were giving me, um, they were giving me T4 instead of T3, I think. And your body wants to, it, it just messed things up. I mean, at first it felt good, but then it went bad. So I quit it, and the withdrawal was terrible. So then when I got my, uh, and I think it was like 180 milligram, 150 milligrams. So I was taking four 40 milligram capsules and it works. It works without ever making you feel bad. You get, you're warm, you feel energy, you want to get up and do things, you feel good. And it's very helpful. And so I did that for probably a year. And then I went and tested again and I saw that my numbers had gone way down. And it was so I thought, well, I'm taking too much. So I stopped uh, I stopped taking it. And then here recently I've had to take uh two a day instead of four. So So how did you know that you should start with four? Well, I just added one. I started with one and that gave me a little lift. So I took another one. And hey, I'm not doing anything but eating a cow's thyroid gland powdered up, so it's not gonna hurt me. So I took three and I ended up taking four and four was what it, what I took. So it might not take four for somebody else. You know, it might just take one. So now, Probably. so yeah, you know, several of us have uh, problems with the thyroid. So it's quite interesting. So it went down from 11 to zero. Mm-hmm. And yeah. do you know mm-hmm. what it is now or? No, I haven't been into, I I, uh, don't like to go to the hospital to be checked on anything because they're always wanting to do something, you know, to you. (laughs) They want you to have a vaccine of some kind or whatever. But um, it was Joyce Held who told me what was wrong with my thyroid. She said that it was poisoned with uh, some kind of uh, common, um, not insecticide, but pesticide like Roundup. And I knew that that was the result. My thyroid had been poisoned from the Roundup that they had given me. And so as it's coming out, which is why I think it's bothering me a little bit again, because I'm, it's coming out now I'm getting rid of it. And as I'm getting rid of it, it's, you know, causing me a little trouble, but uh, I'm getting better every day. So maybe you should put the castor oil pack around there. You know that, yeah, I'm going to write that down. I think you said that to me once before, and I'm going to make a note to do that because I believe in castor oil. So, yeah, thank you so much for sharing. Wow. Yeah, I don't want, I wonder if uh, some of uh, of my little group family here have some questions for you. Lida, you usually have some questions. Maybe not today. That's so, okay. That's just kind of a heavy experience to go through. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, but wow. So yeah, I don't know anything about this voodoo either. And uh, it's uh, yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting that um, I had taken my wrench over to their door once, and she had this doll in her hand with needles in it. And um, if she had just gotten it from Louisiana, she got herself a new voodoo doll. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm like, okay. <laughs> So maybe you could just advertise for the meetings we have with you here usually every Monday? Oh, yes. Uh, Monday, we are talking about Reem's biological theory of ionization. Dr. Reem's uh, actually knew Albert Einstein. And he used, um, he had friends come to him with a child that was having blackouts and little petty malls. And... Um, Now, that was a good comment somebody just made. Yeah, I think you're right. That's exactly why they did that. Because it was my head, remember, where I was having the trouble. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, what was I saying? Oh, so they went to Dr. Reams and said, you have to help us. And he said, I don't think I can help you. And he went and sequestered himself in his laboratory for, um, I think it was over a week, fasting and in prayer. His wife would bring food and the last plate from the last meal was still untouched. And then he felt like God revealed to him how to help that boy. And so he he made that equation. He checked the boy's sugar levels. And he was not having um, seizures. His blood sugar was dropping too low. And so he gave them, told them what to do to keep his blood sugar stable. And he never had another one, I think, maybe one tiny one in his life and then never had another one. So that's when he got started. And. He doesn't work with the blood. He works with the lymph, or he did. He's no longer with us, but uh, he was a brilliant man, and he's been a blessing to me, you know, everything he shared. Amen. Amen. I have a, I have a question, if I may mm -hmm. ask. Hi, Marta. Uh, hi. <laughs> For the thyroid, um, what kind of uh, thing did she use in the States? What is it called? Where did she order it? This, okay. Uh, yeah. Is that product I showed you the other day, Martha? Yeah, yeah but I it. don't remember. So yeah. uh, I, I, yeah, I that was too quick. It looks like this, but this is uh, here is I was buying wrong packet. So here it says adrenal, but it should say okay. uh, thyroid. Okay. And they and sell it. And they sell it. We're selling it allergy research group. Yes. yes. And it's legal in the States. Where did you order it from? From Iver. I get this from Iver. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. You can help her with that. And it was very helpful for me. And Joyce helped told me to take the 10 drops of iodine three times a day. And uh, she had me take selenium as well. Um, did, you did you take iodine beside that? Yes. Well, I I did, and um, yeah, I did take it. I was taking iodine quite regularly because here on the coast in California, we we get all of the uh, radiation from Japan because they're just on the other side of the ocean. It all just comes our way, you know. So we had to try to protect ourselves. Um, you know, one of the things that Doctor Reem sold that he got from Norway was a something no dosum it was a sea not a seaweed or some kind of a seaweed the bromelia bromeliaceous plant that grows there norwegian kelp or something that he used for people that was really good for iodine so um i don't remember who i talked to now but someone said that you can't get too much iodine i had never heard about oh, i think it actually was my doctor in oslo Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, at the time I was having Joyce testing me every month. So when I tested, she, you know, she never told me to slow down taking it. In fact, that was the first real parasite cleanse I did that, that really got rid of a lot of parasites. There was, there is an iodine parasite cleanse out there. And, um, uh, I can't, I haven't looked at it in a really long time, but, uh, they got rid of a lot of them. And so, yeah, it would help to know, you know, for you, what you need. I, I think part of it is your body temperature. Do you have a, like a heat sensing thermometer? Yeah, yes. I can take it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah you yeah. can take, yeah, yeah, take your temperature and then you'll know whether, you know, you're okay or not, or you've taken too much or not. Oh, with iodine. Mm-hmm, Yeah. 
or thyroid or anything if you're too hot. You know, um, I'm going to have to research that a little bit. I want to be careful what I say about that. But I know that because I had Joyce to look at my test results, I felt confident to go ahead and do what she said. You know, and it worked. She's never steered me wrong, but she did get me. It was a kind of a weaker solution of iodine. It was Dr. Clark's iodine, I think. Or there was another one. Was it I, have glucose, I have glucose solution 2.2. How That's much perfect. would I have to take? How much would um, I have to take? 10 drops of that three times a day in water is okay. what she had me do. And it really helped me a lot. Okay, so how long did you take it? Well, I did it for probably a year. Okay. I just kept doing it because uh, I knew that my thyroid was having to clear out toxicity and it needed the support. And you may have some toxicity of some kind as well. I don't know what you've been exposed to. All kind of stuff. Oh, Lots of chemicals because we... We used to have a dairy farm, and that's automatically, even though we went organic afterwards. But yeah, so. No, oh, that sounds wonderful to have a dairy. My grandpa had one, and and so, what kind of chemicals did you use? Well, we used Roundup in the fields and stuff for a while, but then afterwards we went organic. But I did a lot of traveling, and with the through the airports, you know, with all the x-rays they're taking. So that's also uh, not good. Right. So so you got exposed to Roundup also? Yeah, most likely. Yeah. I understand from what I've read that it actually binds itself with your protein cells. It's hard to get it to break free. But they found a way to do it, and I can't remember what it is right now. Anyway, so the Lord's coming soon, and he's going to give us a new everything. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Thank the you Lord. for your information. You're welcome, honey. It. Yeah, so maybe, there's anything else. Maybe you can also share what your sister is going to share with us uh, next oh, two weeks. Yeah. My sister has been really excited about the Eastern question. It's a book that... Uh, our pioneers had, I guess. And we talk about the King of the North and how everything is coming to a close. And it's going to happen. I mean, it's so near that, you know, we know that if Trump gets in, the Sunday law is going to happen for sure. We're just, you know, we know Project 2025 says that's happening. Bam, right off as soon as he gets in. And it seems like he's there for that purpose. But uh, the Lord knows if it's time. And when that happens, everything's going to start to happen pretty quickly. And the Eastern question, when Turkey is what we've read, there's a reference that uh, I saw recently. When Turkey moves its capital to Palestine, then Michael will stand up. And it's over, basically. The, the plagues will start to fall. But when the Sunday law goes through, that's when the trouble begins. The time of trouble begins. And things get more and more difficult. So starting, let's like, say, the beginning of next year. And we, we really have very little time. You know that in the in the story of redemption, Ellen White said that it was a little over 4,000 years when Christ went into the wilderness to be tempted. And that was in 27 AD. So a little over 6,000 years would be 2027. But we know things are going to be cut short. And that's a little over. And I don't know how much over. You know, we don't know how much over. But we know that it's all we're almost there. This is 2024. And uh we we have way less, we have less than three years before it's over. Hallelujah. <laughs> <Good run. laughs> yeah. Yes, we have nothing to fear for the future except forgetting mm -hmm. what God has done for us in the past. Yes, and do not argue with your guardian angel if he tells you to do something. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> 